Hey everybody, Jeff from Corrugated Cavalier here, coming to you today with a slightly different video. Today we'll be taking a look at uh, military textiles, uh, you know, cloth armor, textiles that go underneath armor, textiles that go over armor, and stuff like that, uh, of the mid to late 14th century. And primarily we will be looking at England because A, I'm an English speaker and I'm using this, which is an awesome resource, the Tower Armories in the 14th Century by Tom Richardson. Uh, you can see here, I've uh, torn the cover a little bit, I've been reading this a lot. This is a really, really fantastic resource for anybody who is a huge armor nerd, especially if you're into the 14th century. So before we begin, um, surcoats is often used as sort of just a general term for anything going over the armor. Um, and one of my points in this video is to show that throughout time, and even sometimes at the same time, terms were not always consistent. Sometimes two terms were used for basically the same thing, that it was indistinguishable, or sometimes terms changed over a short period of time, as little as 10 years or less, potentially. Um, you know, we tend to often group periods in the Middle Age uh, in very wide spans, but uh, just like fashion today, um, you know, I guess low-rise jeans are coming back again. Uh, stuff changes pretty quickly in the Middle Ages, it seems. So, let's dive right into, we're going to just before mid-14th century. Um, Fleet's early account, he is one of the keepers of the Tower of London Armory uh, inventory. So, in 1325 to 1330-ish, presumably, as it is some of the early years of this account, Fleet lists 20.5, don't know how there's a half coat armor, but I suppose, um, coat armors, three gambesons, 14 akatons, a tabard of war, and a gown of war. Now, what are all of these things? Um, let's take a quote from this book. Coat armors, which are quite clearly the long sleeveless shirt coats shown on the series of brasses of the late 1320s, and I'll show you a figure in a second. Um, they're quite clearly that. Let me show you here. Going over armor, probably going over just male armor. So you see this dude right here, probably going over just male armor. Um, the detailed descriptions of these coat armors make this identification very clear, as several were fitted with Aylets, eyelets, um, which are those standing shoulder defenses behind that you saw. You can uh, just go back in the video if you want. Seen on those brasses. Um, it also goes on to say the gambesons were quilted quotes, quilted coats, <laughs> similarly decorated with heraldry and intended for external wear, so not really under armor, um, as some people presume. Um, then it goes on to say, the Akatons were quilted garments intended for wear under male armor. So presumably, potentially something like this, though this would be a later form, and we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, and then it goes on to say that the Tabard of War and the Gown of War, they don't really, Tom Richardson doesn't really know and can't find anything in the sources apparently for how those might be distinguished from any other surcoat. Okay, so the Akaton is something worn under male armor, the Gambeson is for external wear, um, possibly just sort of like a cloth armor for foot soldiers, something not completely clear, but it is for external wear, and the coat armors are for wearing over male harness, and they as they have heraldry and stuff like that on them. Um, as we go just about seven to ten years later, into 1337, the terminology is already changing. Um, Fleet lists 152 Akatons in this account, eight more are issued uh, as a set with pairs of plates. And um, the terms akaton and doublet are, quote, almost indistinguishable at this point. Um, I usually refer to doublet. Akaton. Doublet. Akaton. Whatever, Paul. Um, there's also some mention of an akaton of plates, actually, which we will get to a little bit later. So already the terms are changing. So the akaton 
is almost indistinguishable from a doublet at this point. So it was worn under male armor. It could still be worn under male armor, but perhaps it's being issued. Um, they were issued with uh, pairs of plates, which uh, is sort of, as far as I understand a term, what they used for something similar to a brigandine or perhaps like the Munich brigandine where it's like two halves of a breastplate and some smaller plates on the sides and back. Not totally sure, but that's what I take from it. Um, so already the term is changing 10 years from that first account. Uh, let's move on to th about 1340-ish, presumably. In this account, there are a ton more ecotons and doublets. Uh, there are 685 ecotons, 305 doublets, 85 ecotoners, 30 coat armors. So let's. there's a good quote here about this account. The doublets were issued mainly with complete sets of harness, so complete sets of armor, for men-at-arms, indicating that the term was by then used for the arming doublet, as Akaton was used in the previous generation, while Akaton and the cognate Paltuk had come to be used of a quilted garment worn on its own. The coat armors were issued with a set of 30 harnesses for men-at-arms to the garrison of Carisbrook, castle on the Isle of Wight. So the coat armors were external garments that also had heraldry on them at this point intended to go over armor rather than just uh, worn on their own. So once again we see terminology changing already. Before they were presumably worn on their own instead of over harness or mail. As we go on to Mildenhall, he is a next caretaker of the Tower London inventory. 1344 to 1351, so now we're kind of right in the mid 14th century proper. We have 22 shirts, 16 doublets, 11 akatons, nine paltics, three jupons, that's the first time we get that term, and five akatoners, 32 coat armors, and they also refer to them as tunics of arms. So once again, we see terminology changing, plus uh, term now, so new term terminology coming in as well. So after we move into 1350 and after, um, apparently the inventory of the armory stays very, pretty close to the same, uh, but uh, Tom Richardson's book has a great quote here. After 1350, most of these garments remained in the privy wardrobe for some time. The reiteration of them in the various accounts occasionally sheds a little color. For example, the two jupons were decorated with the old arms of England in Smith's account, and one of the ecotoners of plate survived as a doublet of cloth of gold of Flanders, with sleeves of plates riveted with gilt-headed rivets. This may, in fact, reveal the true nature of the ecotoners as conventional quilted ecotons with plate sleeves, like the jacks with plate sleeves of the 16th century. And I'll post a picture of one of those. So most people don't think of that sort of thing being in this period, but it seems like something similar to that was in the Tower Armory at this time. So moving forward into 1373 and 1375, when the inventory does start to change a little bit more, uh, we have John Sleaford as the next caretaker, uh, if you're keeping track. Um, in his third account of 1373 to 1375, uh, we have a large increase in the number of doublets and jacks. So in 1374, we go from 17 doublets to 48 and zero jacks to 173. And then actually in 1381, we go up to 309 doublets and 715 jacks. So this is interesting why um, there might have been that big of an increase. Um, I know it's during the Hundred Years' War. I believe England was sort of losing at that time, but if anybody has any idea of like why there was that big of an increase in any specific battles, uh, please let me know down below. In this period it says that doublets were always issued with harness, full harness, and here's a quote from the book about the jacks. Um, the jacks that were issued were sent to the chamber along with bows, arrows, and pallets, presumably for issue to archers. So uh, we have the term jack appearing in 1374 for the first time in England it looks like, and so this seems to be some armor for archers, while the doublets were always issued with harness at this point. So that seems pretty solidified by 1374 to 1375, but once again, who knows? And here's another good quote about some interchangeability of terms. In 1377, John Tilney, a Paltic maker, sold two Paltics or Jacks, 
of black satin for 100 shillings, indicating by then the two terms were synonymous and that they could be quite expensive garments as well as defenses for the ordinary soldier. So high status, low status, is it a Paltic? Is it a Jack? Um, I usually just go with Jack because it's easier. Paltic! Whatever, Paul. But uh, the Paul Ticker Jack seems to be the same term. So once again, my point here is that there is there seems to be a lot of crossover and changing in terms. So it's hard to say like exactly, oh yes, that's a Jupon, or um, you know, oh yes, that's an arming doublet when you're looking at manuscripts and stuff like that. There might be some things that we can say for sure, like Gambesons probably weren't arming garments and stuff like that. But maybe maybe they were. I could be wrong on that. Let me know if I'm wrong and if you have good evidence on that. Um, I'm going to move to my next source here, but this is a really great resource. Once again, Tom Richardson's book is really fantastic if you're as big of an armor nerd as I am. So the next source uh, is not quite as formal. Um, they do list some of their sources, but this is a class called Martial Surcoats of the 14th Century, taught by Tasha Dandelion Kelly and Marcel de Montségur. I probably butchered that. I don't know French pronunciation at all. And just a couple of points from this. They talk about surcoats in general and their evolution through the 14th century, and it primarily focuses on England and France. Um, in general, by the 1340s and 50s, these surcoats are becoming tighter fitting. They used to be more loose, like you saw in that figure 13 earlier in the video, even if it was over um, some kind of harness other than male over the time. But by the 1340s and 50s, it's becoming more tight fitting. And by the 1350s and 60s, it is solidly what they call a jupon in this class, which is the sort of tight-fitting garment. And I'll put two pictures up, one from their class. And one from the manuscript that I am basing my kit off of, which is actually Italian, but same idea. And this surcoat covering was used, it looks like, right up to the 14th century and was prolific in many parts of the world. The French version seemed a little bit different, but we're not going to talk about that right now. Although, speaking of the French, this goes into my next point, uh, the poor point of Charles de Blas. I'll put, that was probably terrible pronunciation. I'll put a picture up here. Um, so this poor point, uh, a lot of people presume that it is for armor. Poor points, as far as I understand at least, were usually for armor because they had some quilting to keep the armor comfortable. This Charles de Bois poor point is from the second half of the 14th century and is one of the few extant examples that survives today. The cool thing about this is we can see a few features. And I'm going to stand up to show a little bit of that because my army garment is somewhat based off of that Charles de Blas four point. So here you can see that the sleeve is cut in very, very far, close to the center of the chest. There's only really a couple of inches there to the center of my chest. And this is called the Grand Assiette Sleeve, which allows for great arm movement. I have full range of motion in this. I never feel bound at all. Maybe when I get back here, possibly, but even then, I don't think I could put my arms too much further back without uh, an army garment on. So that's one feature of this. And another is, it's hard to see because of how dirty this has gotten, but this is sort of in two pieces, and there's sort of a pocket back here for the elbow. Uh, this is to, once again, allow for great range of motion in the arm. So people refer to that often as the elbow pocket. Both of these are features on that poor point, and a lot of um, people who do arming garments for this period source it off of that. Um, I don't have the exact shape of Charles de Blas by any means, but you can still see, even though I have some chonk around my midsection, that it has this, it would normally go out much further in the chest, but I've got a little bit more than I would like here. But it still does, even, even with me, which is pretty cool. And it cuts in at the waist here to some degree too. If I were thinner, it would even more, but uh, I'm, I'm very happy with this. Um, it's gotten pretty dirty, even just a little bit that I've used it. Um, and I'd like to take this opportunity, I can do a separate video more specifically on this if you want, to shout out the maker of this garment, Tomas Tomeki of AD 1410. 
Um, he did an awesome job. His measuring process is um, very, very involved, but that means it got as good of a fit as you see on mine, which I think is fantastic. Um, his work you know, isn't super cheap, but it's really quality. I'm very, very happy with this army garment. Um, so I'll put a link to his shop below. Okay, so that was a rundown of some of just the terms and some images of military textiles in the mid to late 14th century. I hope you found that interesting. Um, if you're as big of an armor nerd as I am, you probably did. And I really want to make the point that, um, you know, although we know some things for certain, uh, sometimes people get sort of pedantic about these terms, and I just don't think that there's really any point to do so, you know. As I've demonstrated, um, Akaton versus doublet in certain points, sometimes that terminology changes, sometimes they exist at the same time. Same thing with Jack and Paltic, and some of the terms that they list, we don't even know what it was. So I don't think there's any point in being pedantic about these terms. It's I think when people say, oh, that's definitely a jupon, or that's definitely not a jupon, I, they're, they probably don't know for sure. And that's okay. They probably have some understanding of it, and maybe they know something that I don't. I, I'm not really sure. But it seems to me that a lot of times we don't know what these terms actually mean. I hope that was informative. Um, I kind of want to do more on uh, in this style, not exclusively by any means. I want to do one on male of the time. I want to do one on burgundine, pairs of plates, coats of plates, cordzina, whatever it is. That's kind of a big and interesting topic as well. I'll be focusing a little bit more on Italy for that one because I found a really nice article. And one about the Hound School bassinet as well, because I'll be showing mine very soon. All right, thank you all for coming by the channel. Once again, please like, subscribe, share to people who might find it interesting. Be good to each other, and ciao.